Welcome everyone to another session of Systems Evaluation brought to you by the Australian Evaluation Society Special Interest Group. My name is Brian Keogh and this is your Systems Evaluation Committee. You can contact us anytime on this email or join the AES Systems Thinking LinkedIn page. We really enjoy hearing from people about systems evaluation topics you may be interested in or topics you want us to cover. The LinkedIn group in particular is an interactive forum, so it'd be great to see you all there. Everyone is friendly and open regardless of whether you're a beginner or more advanced in terms of your understanding of systems. So it is in that vein of discovery we are very lucky today to be hearing from Andrew Hawkins. Andrew has supervised literally hundreds of evaluations as a partner in ARTD. Anyone that knows Andrew knows that he is a deep thinker and perpetually inquisitive. Today, he'll be talking to us about his personal journey of discovery in systems thinking. Over to you, Andrew. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Yes, this is a system SIG. So we generally chat about system stuff for an hour every couple of months. It's, it's fairly informal. We'll try to bring some stuff that people will be useful. And the other day, we we're having a conversation, and Julie, I think Kara used the phrase, Oh, Andrew, that's just how you ate an elephant. And that was the beginning of some thoughts. So this is just a sort of a bit of a, I don't want to go on too long, but it's kind of a, how did I get to and where have I got to with systems thinking? I've spent quite a lot of time thinking about it, working with these guys and others. Um, and there's just one concept, one concept that I'm going to try and communicate. And it's the bit about like how I broke this thing down into bite-sized chunks. Um, I'm going to just share a very seven second or so, 10 second so video um, that I think, somewhat introduces the one idea that I want to transmit. What are you doing? Levels. <laughs> levels. Yeah, I'm getting rid of all my furniture, all of it, and I'm going to build these different levels, you know, with steps. <laughs> and it'll all be carpeted with a lot of pillows, you know, like ancient Egypt. Mm. Right, that's my one idea, levels. Uh, I'm going to talk about that. And the more scientific way of talking about it is called stratification. Um, so I guess if you've ever lived with more than one person, you have some degree of systems expertise. If you know everything that's ever happened on Earth, you have deep systems knowledge. So what I'm trying to do here is somewhat just demystify the idea of systems thinking, systems evaluation, systems intervention, systems evaluation. Because where I've got to is that systems thinking is about studying how stuff on earth works. And that's both difficult and less mystifying than system thinking needs to be. So recently the idea just occurred to me that actually everything, everything is in a system. Uh, the solar system, electron systems, it's all system, system, system. So, you know, it's everything and nothing particularly special at the same time. Um, so systems thinking for me is thinking about how things work separate from the underlying structures that give rise to the world that might be isolated and studied in science. You know, so gravity, racism, these things can be isolated and studied, but of course no actual, actually existing life operates in any kind of vacuum. Uh, so it's all about systems and I can relax if I don't understand systems completely. Um, the only thing that's not a system is an experimental design to isolate some phenomena so it can be studied, but it creates a system to do this. You need an experimental system in order to do that, which is somewhat ironic. Um, so I'm going to go through a little bit. I've got a few slides. It might be a bit esoteric, um, but please wait till you get the last slide. There's only like 10 or 11 of them, so it's not a large deck, which I think will be uh, quite a useful sort of takeaway messages as far as where I've got to. So the first influence for me was that actually before I started at ARTD, we had Mark Friedman come and run some training on results-based accountability. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but it's been very popular. 
widely used and misused. Um, but the general idea of, of a results-based accountability is there. There's, there's the things that you do and there's the outcomes for the people that you serve and they are separate. There's how much you do, how well did you do it, is anyone better off from the people that you worked with? And depending on how big your entity is will affect how much you actually change the world. But they're separate. You can't just draw a causal link straight between these different levels. Um, the next thing that I studied was realist evaluation. Someone handed me a book, Porson and Dilly, 97, realist evaluation. Made a lot of sense. I got really excited. I thought evaluation seems really cool, coming from psychology, um, in the individual differences side of things. I read the book and then, you know, was disappointed for the next five to ten years of how come evaluation doesn't actually work like that. But what realist helped me think about was obviously the context really matters. Like the intervention happens in a context, and that's as important as what you're doing as to whether you get any effect. So that idea of you can't isolate and understand things. You have to see them in context before you can even understand how they were, even scientifically, on a realist account of science. Next kind of idea came along. One of our PhD um, candidates here was doing something and introduced the idea of complex adaptive systems. Um, and all of a sudden, the language of complexity seemed to be giving me words and you know scientific phrases to explain what I think everybody intuitively understands about how things actually happen in the world, but now finally there was scientific license to start talking about it credibly rather than, than just seeming like you're not good enough to isolate and study everything down to its aggregate atomized parts. Um, so I started to get this idea and then later I was reading some um, realist stuff by Ray Baskar and I started to think about, oh, it's easier to understand the world if you break it into levels already. And of course, science does that. Physics, chemistry, and biology are like different levels. We stratify the world to make it more easy to understand. So we don't try to understand the behavior of a kangaroo hopping through a field by looking at the behavior of quarks and quasars in the atoms that ultimately constitute the kangaroo. Everyone realizes that would be absurd. So we have stratified reality to make it more understandable. Um, there are some overlaps. You can look at the neurochemistry of behavior and look at the links between biology and chemistry, absolutely. But generally speaking, we, we break the world into these layers. Science does it to make it understandable. And then I found that economists had the good sense to do the same thing when they developed macroeconomics separate to microeconomics. And we're, like, we're not trying to understand macroeconomic phenomena like inflation, unemployment, based on the aggregate results of individual studies of the behaviour of all firms and all people in the country. And to try to draw some causal link between the two was seen, again, as impractical. Uh, so you study the two at different layers, different depths of the system. And then I wondered why we don't have that in applied psychology or sociology. Why were we getting asked questions that were essentially of the nature, we do this little program here and we need to measure the impact way up there in some long-term outcome. It seemed to me absurd to economists and absurd to physicists, chemists, and all other branches of science, but, but somehow sensible in the most complex science of them all. So that struck me as very strange. Uh, we then it came across, um, I think one of the things that I, I really like was big history. I don't know if any of you others have seen this big history where it's this idea they break history down into these eight or nine major chunks, thresholds, whereby new things emerge so that were completely unpredictable from the things that came before them. So uh, before stars collapsed, you couldn't predict life on Earth because there was no such thing yet as all of the periodic table, all of the elements that would make up life. So you get this progress of, the, of depth of reality that you can't understand or even predict from more fundamental levels. Um, the idea was that, um, I don't know if anyone knows the Kinevin framework became really important to me because it was the idea is, oh, you can classify systems into types of systems, simple, complicated, complex, chaotic. And so then that helped me understand that, hey, if I want to evaluate a system, first I need to know what kind of system is it? And then it makes it more knowledge, more easy to understand 
as well. Uh, and then I came across some work of Ralph Renger with Brian, and he was studying a particular type of system, the kind of system I'd call a complicated system, not a complex system. So the kind of system they're looking at is like how cardiac care works in a rural state or potentially how McDonald's franchise works. It was knowable. You could see the parts. It was complicated, like a car is complicated, many parts. But it was knowable and it had a common purpose that everyone agreed on. In the case of the car driving, in the case of a cardiac care system, walking out of hospital. So that kind of system lends itself to study in a certain way. But that's far different to the healthcare system. Because like, what is the healthcare system? Does it include nutrition? Does it include a tax on sugar? Would that be considered part of that system? It's all very complex. Um, so there was, it was both simple and difficult. So if I just share some, share this great slides again, if I can. Okay, so you can see that. I imagine, Brian, is that right? Something, oh, you, oh, you're probably seeing the little one. It's all right. So in all of these different approaches, the thing that has become apparent to me, the common thread through all of this is thinking about breaking systems into different chunks. And it can be the depth of the system. How deep are you going? Are we staying in the realm of, chemist of biology? Are we going to go down to chemistry? Are we going to go down to physics? And this is the, the hierarchy, if you will, of the sciences. August Comte invented this idea, but he didn't understand the idea of emergence. So he thought in order to understand sociology, you had to understand everything where they went below it, biology, chemistry, physics, astronomy. Um, but most people would say that's, that's obviously not the case because of this idea of emergence, a new phenomena not predicted at the, at the lower level. But there's this idea of, of levels. Um, and so here is the idea from results-based accountability that what you can be responsible for is your performance at one level, but at a higher level is the actual reason why you're doing things. And there's a difference between your sphere of influence, what you're doing, and your sphere of interest, why you're doing it. But trying to draw direct causal links between the two, which is what we're often asked to do, is the thing that I think we seem to need to resist in systems thinking and be happy to be working within different layers of the system. This was the idea I introduced from the realist idea that actually reality is itself stratified. Not just the way that we learn and know about it is stratified, but the fact that there is real things that we try to study that have real effects, intelligence, racism, gender roles. These are all real phenomena to realists, but they exist in this domain of the real. Sometimes all of these things interact. Well, they always interact and they manifest as actual events. And sometimes we observe them, but the things that we don't observe might still be happening. And there's certainly, but the point of study of science is to understand the causal, deep causal mechanisms that don't actually physically manifest. But the things that we touch and feel, the things we see in a systems evaluation are driven by these deeper causes. So not only is ontology stratified, Epistemology is stratified as well, or vice versa. So the Kinevin framework, I thought, was a really useful uh, addition to this idea because not only do you have the depth of systems, there's types of systems. You know, and I thought experimental evaluation was most appropriate in a very simple system, whereas realist evaluation was useful when things got more complicated. Systems evaluation when things were complex, I probably change that a little now and say systems works in both sides. It just depends on whether it's relatively complicated or complex. The difference being how much emergence is going on, how much unpredictable things are going on, how in a really complex system, people might not even agree on what the outcome of the system needs to be, what the outcome of the housing system. Is it homelessness or is it a long-term investment property for mum and dad or both? Like they conflict, how does that work? That's a complex system. And a chaotic system, kinds of things that happen when you invade other countries. Uh, you end up destroying a whole lot of 
um, emerging properties. So, where did all of that get me to is kind of this slide. Um, and the blog that I wrote was kind of the same thing, which came from having evaluated quite a large number of systems change initiatives, um, at least publicly described as systems change initiatives. Some might be just a bunch of stuff. Some might actually be a systems change because it's worried about the connections and the relationships between the parts and trying to improve those parts. Um, so when I was doing some work in this on a few different systems change initiatives, you know, came across the waters of systems change uh, concept. And lo and behold, here again, everything was being stratified into levels. Um, there were the mindsets that we were trying to transform at this deep ultimate level, then, which is sometimes hard and a long-term proposition. Then there's the, the relationships that we're trying to improve. And that was the thing that I thought many systems change initiatives more feasibly are going to be able to do is improve the relationships within the system. And then at the operational level, there were the usual questions for efficiency about how well did you do the things that you were trying to do. Again, it's all seemed very like RBA as well, stratifying things into the level of what did you do and how well did you do it? So I came up with these four questions for like evaluating a systems change initiative. And the first is like, what is the system we are trying to change? Uh, what type of system is it? Is it one that is a natural system, you know, that gave rise to problems like homelessness and housing system? Capitalism is a system that gives rise to problems. It wasn't a system designed to solve anything. It just kind of evolved. So those are the systems that create problems. Then there's the systems that we come along to try to fix problems. And some of those are complicated, like cardiac care system. And some of those are really complex, like housing and homelessness system. And it's contested and it's messy and there's things going on all over the place that affect everybody else. But the most important thing is to define the boundaries of the system. And systems, that's the first principle of systems evaluation, really, is what it, what's within your, what are you defining as the system? And for me, that's not just the breadth, but the depth of how deep are we going in terms of, of change and how many actors are basically willing to talk to us is my first test of that's how you determine define the system. Who's in your sphere of influence? Not the Queensland child protection system. If the cops won't be willing to work with you on your initiative, then you're going to have to redefine the system to a degree to the pragmatic one of who we can work with. Um, what are the relationships and method models that might be holding us back amongst those in our system? What are the conditions we're seeking to change? And getting clarity on what we mean by the system is really the first step. The next step is then to think about, well, are we funding the right things? Um, once we look at an initiative, we want to know, well, would the intended outcomes of that action change the conditions in the system that we want to change in a meaningful and cost-effective way? Uh, is the next step is, is, well, once you've defined what it is, if it's at the depth of the mindsets that you're trying to change or the relationships you're trying to change or some certain activities and programs you're trying to implement into the system that you think will have a meaningful impact, and you're, then you need to go, well, what realistically are we going to be able to achieve by these initiatives and understand it as a proposition for action? And what you're trying to come up with is a coherent plan that will uh, shift these conditions that avoids the needs for heroic assumptions. If you could put a plan together that subject matter experts agree that yes, if we achieve those outputs and those assumptions hold, those general outcomes will come, then I'd say you have a, a valid proposition for action. The rest of evaluation of implementing that action is about whether or not all those conditions that were necessary actually came about. If they did, then it's not just a valid proposition, it's now a sound proposition. Uh, then we move, so we just want to know then once we've funded the right things, did the people we fund do what they said they would do? And if, this, if you're a grantee running a systems change initiative and you're giving money to someone to do something and they've convinced you it's a good idea, the outcomes have already baked in because the outcomes are a product of what you chose to fund and then what they did. But then asking them to go and measure their outcomes in a complex system at the level of the whole system is firstly something they very rarely can actually do. 
and people waste a lot of time and effort on the rhetoric of we need outcomes to make decisions about how to improve our performance, which is a fraud in most cases. You don't learn how to improve your intervention by trying to attribute the outcomes to some ultimately important, the why you're here question, but not the what you're doing question. And if we all, I'm sure we're all familiar with the amount of wasted potential that's gone into that, measuring an outcome when we could have used that time and money to look at what we're doing and make it better. The example would be a very simple one is a polio vaccination program. If we were going to vaccinate people against polio, should our evaluation measure the outcomes in terms of the number of people who do and don't get polio? Someone might say that sounds like a good idea. Um, but all you're going to be doing is then trying to reestablish what's already been shown clearly to demonstrate that immunisation does work to prevent polio. So if you want to spend those evaluation dollars in a way that actually helps people on the ground, you're probably going to spend it better trying to improve the system of immunisation that you have to increase the reach of it, to get more people, understand the barriers to uptake and all those things, rather than spending a lot of time and money in a one-off trial that's replicating well-established research and I would say is a waste of taxpayers' money. So then my point being, once you've chosen the things that you think are a good idea to make change of conditions that are within your control to change, and the people that you've given the money to have done what they said they were done and done it well and achieved the outputs and realistic outcomes that they could achieve, you've just got to start asking yourself, well, are we, are, is the system, current system conditions now, next year, suggest that we should do more of the same? You know, are we doing the right things right? Good, move along. Are we doing the right things but wrong? Well, you'll understand that because the people aren't doing what's in question three. They're not doing what they said they would do. Or the difficult one, are we doing the wrong things right? Are we doing lots of education campaigns really well when it turns out actually what would be better here would be a tax on some behaviour or something simpler and cheaper that we could feasibly do? And so then you have to ask your questions, should we be scaling up, up the causal system, higher level stuff? Should we be scaling deep, getting down into deeper causal mechanisms and understandings and going deeper with individuals? Should we be scaling out and trying to increase the reach of this thing? Or should we be scaling back and thinking about doing something else? And to evaluate in a systems change initiative for me is just this constant cycle of asking this question of like, is what we're doing a good idea? Does it make sense given the current health of the system as we've defined it? Um, and what can we be accountable for is our performance. Yes, some people can be held account for their performance. If we're the funder, we are somewhat more accountable for the changing conditions of the system. And then our big role is to make sure we're funding the right things. Once they've given their money, their most important role is to do what they were funded to do and do it well. But so often we ask them to measure their outcomes to demonstrate to us that we should keep funding them. When it was our decision to fund them that it should be subject to evaluation, maybe we funded the wrong people and we should be accountable for that, not the grantee. And finally, oh, as I get back to my favorite philosopher, some wisdom. But yeah, don't ask for more precision than you can afford or is worth doing. Uh, go for accuracy over precision. So it's a little bit longer than I wanted, but that was kind of my little journey, part of the history of where I got to. So I think, Brian, over to you. You may want to ask some questions. Other people might want to ask some questions in the chat. I would really like other people might want to share where they're at with systems evaluation because primarily this is a forum for people talking and hearing other people, not one person like giving a preso. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Um Tara, if you want to just keep an eye on the chat and pick up any questions that come through about uh, systems that are, are really important. Andrew, like from a systems perspective, um, I know the American Evaluation Society put in place principles to, um, to uh, guide systems evaluation. Do you want to talk about those four principles or I can remind you of a few of them? Uh, you're just on mute, Andrew. Sorry. 
so we're seeing a screen. I think you're still on mute. Uh, I have not used to Zoom so much. <laughs> so I couldn't find Sorry, I could so, go to Teams. Um, good question. Um, some of you might know Brad Asprey. Brad Asprey and I are putting together a, a course for ADS on foundations of evaluation. We developed some cheat sheets and we did one on dominant paradigms. And I believe, here we go. These are some of the, if you look at the screen, you can see some of the key concepts and evaluations about perspectives, interrelationships, emergence and boundaries. I believe they might be the four that the SIG came up with, but um, over to the others to want to talk about. Uh, yeah. Um, well, they're the ones that I remember particularly. But uh, James Ong has got a hand. So, uh, uh, James, do you want to ask a question? Come yeah, in. sure, Brian. Yeah, I'm pretty good. So, yeah, thanks, Andrew, for giving um, a talk about how your thinking of systems evaluation has evolved. Um, I was just uh, wondering, what are your thoughts on the increasing movement of evaluation towards experimental methods and randomized controlled trials? Because it seems like there's probably a tug of war between um, experiment going to the causal mechanisms in uh, evaluation and showing that programs uh, work in a randomized, um, controlled way and systems evaluation where we're encouraged to actually look uh, more into um, systems and evaluating the programming context. Yeah, okay. Thanks, James. Well, it's a huge question, obviously, that I can't adequately answer uh, in this time. But, I mean, the idea of an RCT is to try to isolate and understand the, ind the causal impact of a program irrespective of context. It literally tries to control for context to find the true causal impact of a program. So if you have an entity that is stable, mature, you have large sample sizes and the ability to test a whole program, and if that seems to make sense to stakeholders to want to know that, then uh, a randomized control trial is an appropriate way, the best way, in fact, to answer the question of the true independent impact of the program. However, others will have a more philosophical, deeper philosophical problem with the whole approach, given what I said was saying earlier, that mostly there is no independent impact of many things in complex systems. They interact and engage in dynamic ways. Uh, if a program were as simple as something as like 10 milligrams of a drug that was being injected for which we felt most people's bodies would react with it in a similar way or not, it makes sense to isolate and try to measure the independent impact of that if we think the intervention to take a realist view is actually some stuff that happens that gets interpreted in people's minds which leads them to make different decisions different behaviors which interact with all the other people and like things going on and that generates outcomes you might start going that well programs are not the same sort of thing that lend themselves to that kind of study they're not isolatable and real easily defined and precisely defined definable uh, some might be. A particular type of reading pedagogy might be very easy to define and study with an RCP, and you will provide useful information about whether reading style A or reading style B, phonics or whatever is the other one. You can, you know, you can conceivably generate useful information, but ultimately the question always is, what is the thing we're trying to evaluate and what can we usefully be known about it using other people's money? Let's not forget it's public sector stuff, it's taxpayers' money. And we can go on a vanity project of like measuring long-term outcomes because it makes us feel good to say, hey, this is what I achieved. But I mean, would you do that with your own money or would you use your own money just to use a lot less of it to try to understand how I could do this a bit better? And I think some of that lack of discipline is what leads to some uh, uh, inflated approaches to what evaluation is as distinct to what scientific research is. I think, Andrew, there's a good comment in the in the chat about that, but I think the one um, every every approach has its value. I think the trap that people fall into is that they think that that there's there's a winner and there's not. You have to understand what particular approaches are good at are good at doing and what they're not good at doing, and use them appropriately. And an RCT, as you're saying, is really good for understanding a very specific kind of primarily contextless causal mechanism. But if you then, you can't, you know, there are natural limitations around that, but uh, my observation is meant 
not enough people appreciate where where you where those you know where the strengths and weaknesses sort of start and stop and being kind of honest about that um because again there's 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 limitations with taking a systems view you can't it's harder to get that level of precision um yeah i mean there's a very interesting uh diagram i think that uh is in the book about critical systems theory that says science is fantastic and rct at massive numbers like statistical significant numbers or in very isolated instances and yet um so i think it's great you know if you can do an rct fantastic that's really really good but as someone said in the chat and i'll just go down to it is um Crefton parker said in the chat why not do both yeah i think that's yeah. fantastic that's great yeah. what, about the next, what about the next question let's move on mm. to the next one about so this is a good question this is a concern about long-running programs may center on how well the program is running but often fail to look at the bigger picture and whether ideally we should be doing something else and how do you balance those needs? I, that's a great question. And that that's in many part, if you go and have a look at results-based accountability and despite the scary kind of name, if you're not familiar with it, it's, 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 not, it's not totally reductionist. It's quite a sophisticated idea. Uh, but the idea is that you have, a, a, you have um, the bigger picture, the conditions in the world that you're setting out to change. Uh, um, and that might be the well-being of communities and children living and breathing uh, in a society. And you may have some kind of child protection, child welfare program that you're doing really well. If you're, you know, how, and you're looking at how much are we doing it, how well are we doing it, is anyone better off? That's within our control. And we can go, great, you know, that's working really well. But then we look at the problem and we see that, you know, child removal is still going up. And we're starting to look at the, the system, the health of the system is getting worse despite what we're doing. And so then you have, then there's a question about instead of trying to, it's one option, the option I would take, instead of trying to measure a causal impact between what I'm doing and that um, is, to, is to absolutely look at that and absolutely discuss, are we doing enough or are we doing the right things or do we need to advocate for more resources? because the system is not getting better. And sometimes sometimes when the system's not getting better or the most, the biggest change that needs to happen is more people need to be doing more things that aren't being done. It's not just a matter of scaling up what you're doing. So if, you, if you're looking at it and it requires humans, I mean, I think that's the number one thing I would say is it's humans need to, who know what they're talking about, sit in room and discuss these things and reason about, do we need to be doing better at what we're doing? No, we're doing a good job, but the rest of the system is not operating. Maybe we need to start hooking in with all of the other actors in the system that we know and start sharing resources and coordinating because and then we have shared metrics about our shared goal of what we're trying to go for. And sometimes we can be going like, hey, we can't turn the tide here. You know, and that's when you start moving from programs to advocacy for resources out of the political system to, to do things. I don't know who might have other views. Andrew, there's a, another great question from uh, Kieran Golvin, um, and that is a sense check. As Kieran, do you want to unmute and just ask? Yeah, yeah. Um, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah, so um, in, in my role, we do grant making and we're sort of moving toward, towards a sort of like longer term strategic grant making systems change projects um, and we're focusing on sort of novel initiatives. So is what you're saying is that we should be commissioning sort of like exploratory evaluations that might start to unpick some of these calls and mechanisms um, and then assessing those sorts of like intermediate relational outcomes and then when we want to aggregate our impact looking at like systems trend rather systems trends rather than trying to ask individual grantees to measure their outcomes. I think I think from what I heard of that was yes, I think I agree entirely. Mm. Keep it simple and get people to focus on that which they can reasonably do something about. I, 
I think I was reading something here. Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, uh, said it's irrational to focus on things you can't control. Mm. So if you're going to like determine your value, like in terms of the performance of this grantee based on outcomes that are so far out of their reach, that that's irrational. Now we've been taught that what we need to do is try to work out how much they're changing that and use that information to decide whether we should fund them more or not. Firstly, it's very hard and very expensive and requires a sophisticated grantee to come up with some kind of quantitative causal inference that measures that connection. Secondly, it may never happen again. They may have just done a really nice history project and said what happened, and there may be no likelihood of that ever happening again. I mean, you train the same people in the same way and the same things, you're not going to get the same increase in knowledge because they've already got that knowledge. So you've got to keep doing different things. So I would agree, absolutely, you want to focus on the bigger picture and focus on what you're doing. And if their link doesn't seem right, you might have to go to a grantee and go, I know we've funded you for 20 years and I know you've done great work. And a lot of good things are happening. But we've looked at what's happening in the system in terms of, and we've, we've strategically identified this issue over here is the something that we need to do something about. And we want to redirect resources to that, even though you're doing a good job. Thank you so much. Um, Andrew, oh. I, I was going to say, I agree with you. And I just, I saw a couple of things in the chat there. And I, this is something that I'm, uh, I, I just think we also need to maybe address for clarity. Um, I think there's some confusion um, around the, the use of the word RCT. An RCT is a randomised control trial and looking at a couple of the questions about the ethics associated with them. They are controlled randomness. So what we often hear about people talking about RCTs and the, the, the you know, a lot of the rhetoric that's happening in Australia at the moment, what they're actually talking about a quasi experimental um, is a quasi experimental approach where you're kind of retrospectively creating a, a control group, but you're not actually creating it from the beginning. Um, and certainly, there are a lot of ethical issues with it, particularly in social interventions, um, which is why um, you don't use different countries have more or less enabling environments for that to, ha to happen. Um, and without getting into the, the the full ethical debate around that, I do I, I think it's just really important that people understand that they are two different things. They're seeking to do a very similar thing, but an RCT is a specific type of experimental approach and how we often are using the word is not correct. What we're actually talking about is a quasi-experimental design. Thanks, Cara. Um, Graham has got his hand up as well. Oh, hello. Uh, thank you for that. It's all very interesting. I thought I would share one quote I heard recently that pertains to your comment about asking grantees to deliver and the grantor should should worry about outcomes and it actually came from a private sector source so i'll translate and it said something like focusing on profit insert outcomes is like playing tennis with your eyes on the scoreboard and not on the ball mm. yeah yeah another one um i heard another nice quote like that brad asprey said the other day uh i think i forget who the originator was but uh Knowing last week's score doesn't prepare the coach for next week's game. Yeah. yeah. You know, you can – so there's so many – yeah, but thank you, Graham. That, that's a great one. Okay. Uh, Anna's got a comment. Anna, do you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Andrew. I was just thinking about – the role of ex ante evaluations. And I know, I think we sort of don't tend to talk about them much with that language anymore, but when you go back and look at ex ante and what it really is trying to do, I, th I often think if only this had happened prior to the intervention or prior to the decision about who to fund and, and why, we could have ended up with a really different outcome. And I guess mm. I've just been thinking about that in terms of the systems context and wondering how you see it in relation to some of the systems eval theory. 
Oh, well, if that was a Doris Dix and that, I would say thank you. That was that's a question. <laughs> it's not. But... Uh, it's not, but it's, yeah, that is my number one passion actually is ex ante evaluation or prospective evaluation or evaluating the proposition that's being put forward before you spend any money on it and roll people in it to ask, is this a good idea and would this work? And thinking more like a venture capitalist who's putting their own money into it, mm -hmm. thinking like, somebody writing a new policy proposal at the federal level. And I've recently been having some interesting discussions with people about what is the contents of a new policy proposal. It tends to focus a lot about describing what is the problem, why we should be seen to be doing something about it, and then how much money are we going to throw at it. And relatively little on the bits of, like, why this would actually work. Like, you know... Are these assumptions heroic or what are the assumptions and are they heroic? And do staff want to get on board with this new way of working? And I agree. I think, you know, John Dewey said, a problem well-defined is half solved. If you look at a proposition for action and it, the assumptions are shaky uh, and it doesn't look good, uh, you can do a very cheap evaluation, you know, a few people in a room for a few hours to sort of say, hey, this isn't, this isn't going to work. Um, I had an interesting conversation as well about like this in terms of the difference between theory of change and program logic. And I was going, okay, I think what I've come to, there's a sort of a missing middle. So you can have a theory of change that has some really nice stuff. We talk about that national HIV stuff. And I think it was a, I can't remember what the, exactly what it was, but there were high level principles about uh, testing and, and prevention and reducing stigma or great, you know, theoretical things that we need to do to, you know, that we want to achieve. And then at the other end, there's a sort of a list of intended outcomes that we hope to see. But what hasn't happened is someone hasn't interrogated the very middle and gone, hang on, do the states and territories coordinate in this way? Do, do, do the local organisations that we're going to fund actually have the capability to implement this HOY testing thing? Or are they dealing with other crises and they don't even have attention for this? Like some of those real world, real politic type questions could kind of get glossed over both by policy designers, politicians and evaluators, and an ex ante evaluation could actually diagnose and look at these problems and much more cheaply, pre yeah, prepare things. So I 100% agree, and and I, I would love to see more ex ante or prospective evaluation. Just not all ex ante CBAs, just to be... Just to be clear, because most ex ante evaluation that I've seen is actually a CBA with some um, often often questionable assumptions. Thanks, Andrew. The person that's done an ex ante um, CBA, or a lot of them, Andrew, I object to that kind of. You just obviously had a poor person. Um, Jasper's got his hand raised. Jasper, come in. Thanks, guys. Yeah, look, just just seconding uh, Anna's comment, I suppose, and and Andrew would be interested to know who you've been talking to about some of those approaches for the MPPs. I, God, I really hope it's New South Wales Treasury, um, but also would be keen from anyone to understand if there are sort of thoughts on the best ways to do prospective evaluations in the context of a very tight time frame to put together a new policy proposal. So in New South Wales, it's often, you've got to have your strategic business case ready in October. So you'd have to have a fair bit of work done by that point, but you might not even know until this point where we are right now with the budget that it was announced about you know, two, three weeks ago. Now you kind of get the go ahead. So you've basically got August, September to do any prospective evaluation if you hadn't already planned this for a couple of years, which you would have done in an ideal world. But what do you think about that kind of tight time frame to do this work? Well, other, other people might have um, views. So I'll just say very quickly, if you get a bunch of experts in a room and you describe what you're going to do and what you're relying on for that to work, and the people say that's bullshit, that's a prospective evaluation that might take a day. So Cara and I have both done uh, courses in uh, rapid impact uh, evaluation. Cara, do you want to talk a bit about that? Because we found that really helpful. Yes, although I probably wouldn't use that. I, I was actually going to say something different, um, if I may. Um, I think the key thing to a, a prospective evaluation 
is testing the assumptions that are going alongside the design because that's the piece that I think the the, the greatest crimes of wishful thinking occur um, and an honest interrogation of how realistic some of the assumptions are. Um, so I, if it was... Um, if it was me, I think actually almost like a screening process where you, um, you know, it's almost like the novelty factor because that's going to make it um, uh, the, the likelihood of the, you know, the, the, the solidness of the ground that you're standing upon um, more or less shaky. And then genuine having an honest conversation about how how valid are the assumptions that we're making here. Um, and use that as your starting point, particularly if you had, you know, and 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 then figure out from there. Okay, might we need to sort of go a bit harder in that ex ante um, sort of evaluation and really kind of really test some of those? Or if 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 in, in generally it, it seems to be holding up, then then you might um, take a slightly different approach. But yeah, I think for me, that's what what we often see is that sort of design in a hurry um and people just don't stop to I, I, I just I, yeah it, it's one of my biggest bugbears is just these outrageously fan, sort of wishful assumptions that get made um in those early stages often to fulfill political um needs um but I think we still have to be honest about it um and then yeah deal with it in some way Julie, you've got your hand so, up. Um, I'm just going to answer Jasper just before mm. I'm just going to jump in there. Um, I found uh, Dr. Andy Rowe's work and rapid impact mm. uh, evaluation really helpful. I, you know, I've gone through it in a great deal of detail and I find it is what it says it is. It's a rapid and cost-effective way yeah. to do an ex-ante uh, evaluation. So, uh, Jasper, you've got my contacts. If you want to know more about it, happy to uh, take you through the process. Thanks, Brad. Chuck you but it does Julie. require people coming into a room, like yeah, yeah, as as actually any good evaluation would require you to do. Yeah, but it it has a lot of legitimacy, so uh, mm. it's certainly got a lot of evidence behind it. Yeah, Julie. Thanks. So, um, you know, when they, when Michael Jackson maps out all the complexity of the, the systems approaches, uh, he uses the simple complicated and complex ideas, but also looks at, you know, the unitary pluralist and coercive ideas. And mm -hmm. so I was really pleased to hear you say about um, systems approaches that sort of look at the complicated systems, like, like the car example that you gave, because I think it's important that we differentiate and talk about what the nature of the different types of systems that we work in. So some could be quite straightforward and simple, like improving a queuing system at a at a service delivery station or something like that. That's going to be very different different to working on some sort of entrenched, messy, wicked problem, right? And and um, one of the things that's really interesting to me is that in in Jackson's mapping. He only covers um, pluralist and coercive um, stakeholder independencies for the simple systems. And so what we have to acknowledge is that we haven't really got clear guidance from systems thinkers, systems theorists on how to um, work in the messy space that many of us work in. And so we have to put things patchwork things together as best we can. What, what do you think about that idea, Andrew? Well, I'll profess not understanding all of the concepts, um, but I would say, look, almost all of it just comes down to being real, like getting real and cutting the crap and thinking about, look, what can we actually change here? Like, who am I? What power do I have? Who's willing to talk to me? Who's willing to work for me, with me? What is the system that we can define and then go to what extent can we all agree on a certain path forward? 
Um, and a lot of it is going to be focusing on, I mean, the fundamental idea of a system is it's, it's not the parts that matter, it's the relationships between the parts. And that's where system properties emerge. That's where the beauty of anything that happens with multiple people is that emergent property of people working together. So almost always it's about improving the relationships between people who have some kind of common goal and working out what have you got the time and money and energy and expertise to do about it and not over-hyping what you're going to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I understand, of course, that people work in a area where they're trying to attract funding and people feel good when they can measure their outcomes and show people some plausible impact that they've achieved, even though the key principle of a system is that no one person achieves anything. Which So it's kind of counterintuitive for people to start claiming how much they've achieved. But I'm not sure that really answered your question, Julie. Do you ever work in areas where there are competing interests, like more powerful interests, and that the um, people potentially affected by the program have no power to express their, their views? But they're at the mercy of the most powerful people. And what do we do in those sorts of spaces? Well, the one thing I've seen that's been, I found a very welcome and useful um, antidote is bringing in people with lived experience uh, in a particular area and intended beneficiaries. And there's lots of ways that can go wrong, but there's lots of value that people can add. And I would say probably the main value that they add is having the license to say, well, with all due respect, this program doesn't make sense. That I wouldn't respond to that program, or that is not going to achieve that. If you're going to, if you want me to be in a certain mentally healthy way, just doing that ain't going to cut it. And so I think people can can bring in a degree of realism and have the permission to say, to call out and point out where things are not sufficient is one reason. Okay, fantastic. I think we're going to have to end there, um, and we just conclude by. Thank you, Andrew. Fantastic, Andrew. You always um, come up with uh, great ideas and great discussions. So it's really, I know, just working on the committee with you is just fantastic. Um, I've put in the LinkedIn group a few times on the chat. So we would love to engage in broader interaction and conversation with people about systems. We learn as much as you do, and that's what we're on about. So we would encourage you to join. The cost to join is really expensive. Um, I think it's... It's your time. Oh, yeah, it's your time. And no it's dollars. Your energy. And no dollars. Um, so uh, yeah. please just, join us. And the final message is don't bite off more than you can chew. I think that's the final advice. Thanks, everyone.